certainly helping uh, to, to manage the business of research, but also focused on what IT leaders are looking to for the future and what's on IT leaders' minds. And I literally spend about half my time out on the road talking to IT leaders and presenting at forums like this about the trends that we see in the marketplace. And what I'd like to do today is really share with you <coughs> our view of how IT is evolving, a bit about where we've been, and a lot about where we're going, and how that's impacting business, and how it's truly transforming the world. Um, so with that, um, when you look at the IT marketplace and where we are in the IT marketplace, you can see that, you know, very simplistically, if we go back to 1996, the market was growing very, very rapidly in terms of overall IT spending at about 15, 16% per year with some, with some peaks and valleys around Web 1.0, where we had a dot-com crash in, in uh, 2000, 2001. Then we had a crash in, uh, we kind of emerged with Web 2.0. We started to see these new business models that were really powered by ubiquitous broadband and by uh, browser-based technology and the emergence of HTML. We saw, again, this, this new range of companies come up, and then we saw a crash again with the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and we are, which is kind of gets us to where we are today. But where we are today is really this emergence of four technologies, cloud, big data, mobile, and social which make up a third platform. And I'll guarantee you that in the future, we will not have the straight line growth of between five and 7% growth. What we'll have are peaks and valleys, but the underlying demand will be fueled by the intersection of these four new technologies that are really coming together to power the world in a new way. So if we look at <clears throat> IT spending and where we expect to see IT spending, um, I'm doing something a little bit, a little bit clever here or tricky here. It says 2011 compared to 2012, and then a single data point out to 2017. But what you see from an IT industry is that across the world, IT is really struggling right now as we get into 2012, whether it be Western Europe, whether it be the United States. Um, obviously, there are some bright spots like uh, Asia Pacific, which is you know, running in excess of 10% growth, but starting to cool as China slows down. But if you let your eyes go all the way over to the right-hand side, you can see from a worldwide demand standpoint, we expect the market to be just under about 4% growth this year. And then as we get to 2017, we expect that to be around about 3% annual growth. So that's interesting to show, and you can see, you see the hot spots, areas like Middle East and Africa, areas like Asia Pacific. But when you get underneath it, you start to see the trends are starting to change. This is the same data, but it's shown by now technology categories. So now if you look at the technology categories, you can start to see where this third platform, and when I talk about the third platform, why things are starting to feel different in the marketplace. For the first quarter of this year, personal computers, which are all the way on the left hand of this chart, dropped 20% worldwide. And this is one of those trends we could see coming, and it felt this way for a long time. But now they've, again, you know, really started to see and fall victim to the, to the, to the impact of mobile phones and to the impact of, of tablets. Servers as well, uh, they, they, and, and again, you see this drop to 5%. That's an annual forecast for the year. 20% was simply the, the, the unit forecast for the first quarter. You can see that uh, servers are starting to drop as well. And we're seeing that, what Paul will talk about in a few minutes, the power of virtualization means that you simply don't need as many physical servers in order to spin up many, many hundreds of virtual, or thousands of virtual machines. Storage is an interesting category because we just can't stop creating data. We still are doubling the amount of data that we create every 12 to 18 months. And that, again, means that you have a very, very large set of data that has to be stored and mirrored and replicated and protected all on the, all on the web. Network capacity will continue to grow. But then you'll see some blistering hot areas, like mobility, where, where for mobility for 2012, we're seeing about 17% growth. You know, interestingly, people ask me, what is the impact of mobile phones and smartphones on the overall IT department, on the overall IT market? Isn't that kind of a consumer or gadgety market? If I took mobile out of the overall IT market, remember I said IT will grow somewhere around 4% this year? Mobile represents 1.7% of that growth. That gives you an idea of how huge and immense mobility is and how mobility is fundamentally changing the world. 
the cloud is blisteringly hot and will continue to be by 2017 over 20% growth. And then software and services tend to trail but tend to be quite steady, some of those in excess of 5% by 2017. So again, you're starting to see these changes, but, but what are we seeing? Well, what's happening is, and I won't spend much more time on history, but we're really entering what we believe is a third platform. The first platform was sort of when dinosaurs walked the earth. This was ma the mainframe era. And the mainframe era, the computer stayed in a proper, in a, in, in, in a private room. You weren't allowed to touch it. People in white coats managed it. And you asked questions of smart people who then wrote queries, and those queries came back to you in the form of reports. And you had literally thousands of people being supported by thousands of computers around the world. Sorry, tens of thousands of people, thousands of computers, really hundreds of applications that were all really doing a lot of sort of complex calculating. And then those forms that were created were used in business. The, first, the next transition came in the second platform, which was the emergence of the client-server platform. This is where the personal computer basically went around the world and eliminated, gave us massive amounts of productivity and eliminated layers and layers and layers of senior management and middle management around companies because we simply became more efficient. We got massive productivity gains. This is where Cisco literally wired the world. And people were talking about a trillion dollar market cap at one point for companies like Microsoft and Cisco as they scaled their technologies around the world. And, and literally, we wired ourselves together and started communicating. What's interesting about the second platform is that this is the platform that we know as an IT industry. This is the platform that we're exiting from and that, and that, and that, and that, it, and that things are really changing from. So, so again, this is, the, this, is, this is the framework that many, many companies come from. But what we're moving to is this third platform, where cloud, big data and analytics, mobile and social will represent a place where massive innovation happens at the intersection of these technologies. And at the intersection of these technologies, you will see new kinds of innovations around big data or around the cloud or around mobility that will fuel new kinds of industries and that will transform the retail experience or the energy management experience or the financial services industry. And that's really the exciting part. But when you see the companies that are trapped on that second platform and are struggling for growth today to move, this is the reason why. In our industry, which is running about a trillion and a half dollars today, in our industry, 95% of the growth in the industry, the absolute dollar growth worldwide, will be associated with that third platform. So if you're a second platform company and you're not participating in the, in the new third platform, you've got a big problem. And this is what leads companies like Hewlett Packard to buy autonomy to get into the big data market. Because they have to get there as quickly as possible. Because, the, again, the stakes are just so, so high to be able to participate in this new growth engine. So the third platform, what does that mean? What that really means, the implications for CIOs, it means you used to think about systems. Now you have to think about delivering advanced services and all the underlying technology to deliver those services. You have to think about moving from having an IT area that's, uh, sorry, an IT department that's agile to transforming your IT leaders into, how do I translate into the business? How do I make myself more business agile and creating business agility? It's a super, I mean, again, I talk to CIOs all over the world. They fall into two categories. The CIOs that are looking for an attaboy or an attagirl for cutting their percent of spend as a percent, for cutting their spend as a percent of revenue over and over and over, and I can tell you where that movie ends. And the CIOs that are focused on partnering with the business and driving innovation. And they're very, very different. And, 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 and they, uh, they, they end in very, very different places. And then moving from really <coughs> information and just collecting information to how do I turn that information into innovating in my business? How do I create a staff of IT leaders that can sit at the business table and say, here are a set of tools, line of business, that we help us innovate and move forward in a new way. 
So these are some of your, your, your implications, and you can see across the top how we will be transforming industries going forward. So when I talk to CIOs, what is the progress that they're making on this third platform? Well, they feel most confident about the cloud. And they feel like mobile device strategy has just kind of happened, and mobile devices are moving in to the enterprise. They feel like they're a little bit further behind in big data and analytics. And mobile application strategy, they feel like they're, and I'll show some data later, they're quite far behind. They really don't understand how to capitalize and how to think about really transforming their business. And this is a very dangerous place because they're letting too many people make, too many outside service providers make the decisions for them who really don't understand their business and how through mobile and context and location you could transform a business. And then social, we'll talk about, really people don't understand. So they feel, everyone feels they're very, very behind in social and people quite frankly just don't get how they can capitalize on social yet. And we'll go into these in, in, in quite a bit more detail. Let's start talking a little bit more about the cloud. This is some, this is some, some, some recent survey data about what, uh, what IT workloads are you, are you looking to move to the cloud? Are you comfortable moving to the cloud? Either a public cloud or a private cloud. And when you see, you can see that you know, pretty much it's, it's, it's the hierarchy of applications. The, mo the easiest, most simple applications, some of them were even born on the cloud, like email um, or, 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 uh, or collaboration apps. Those things, everyone's very comfortable moving to the cloud. And as you move down, even you know, marketing, those things are all moving to the cloud. There's the sort of core IT help desk and IT management. That stuff's all moving to the cloud. It's not until you really get to the big data apps and then the, and the, and the other sort of legacy apps. Those are a lot harder to move to cloud. Some of those are because the vendors don't want you to put those in the cloud. And some of those are because the perception is the corporate jewels, the data of the company, I'm just too concerned, or the governance and risk and compliance um, uh, issues are too complex for me to deal with to put those into the cloud. That will change. People will become more comfortable with that, particularly around big data, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. But today, this is kind of where we are. A lot of people are getting comfortable storing in the cloud and moving sort of their traditional applications, uh, particularly, particularly uh, the, the ones that are uh, heterogeneous across the business, business functions, uh, into the cloud. Um, I'll talk about the greater cloud opportunity. Uh, a, a bit and sort, of, and sort of how big this opportunity is. And, and, the, and, and the answer is it's quite large. Today we have, uh, we have private clouds and then we have public clouds. If I, look at the, if I look at the private cloud and the public cloud opportunity, you're looking at by 2016 about $26 billion that will be spent on building dedicated private clouds. And about $100 billion that will be spent on public clouds. These would be things like Amazon or Google or uh, Windows Azure, for example. But that's not all of it. There's also the gear. There's also all the gear you have to buy, all the software and, and, uh, and, and, and hardware you have to buy to power the cloud. There you're going to spend another $35 billion building out the cloud. And that's going to have a 20% you know, compound annual growth rate. And then, of course, there's the network services and the IT services to power the cloud, which will be another $20 billion by 2016. So when you add all this up, it's well in excess of $150 billion that we'll be spending at a compound annual gro growth rate that's about 20% um, for the cloud. So when people say, you know, is the cloud kind of getting rolling? Yes, the cloud is getting rolling. It's growing at a very, very fast rate. And it's, it's allowing companies to transform their business models. And it's dramatically reducing the barriers to entry for many, many industries. So people that you think you are competing with today, you may not be. Because of these cloud services, companies can spin up a, uh, an offering very, very quickly, and they can be competing with you in new ways uh, a very, very effectively and rapidly. So again, this, this, this cloud thing is something that is, is happening, and you can see some of the opportunity for the system suppliers that are, th that, that are associated with it. And when I talk to IT vendors, what I, what, I, what I often ask them is, are you thinking about a new world where as people move to this public cloud, these data centers will become immense and they'll become very, very large and very, very fast. So are you restructuring your company to not necessarily be calling on you know, 3,000 enterprises around the world, but 300 data center companies? Because so many of those 3,000 enterprises will be using these cloud uh, service providers for their IT infrastructure? And are you restructuring your company for that kind of a change where if you lose one of those 300 companies, you may not be able to survive as a business? So big changes in accelerating in cloud. So cloud becomes this hybrid IT destination where you have your data center and then you have above that, you have 
mar marketing departments buying software as a service, say for uh, Salesforce.com or for SuccessFactors. Uh, platform as a service, where you basically can a get access to a platform where you can innovate and have your developers innovate on top of that platform. And then, of course, infrastructure as a service for the raw compute and raw storage kinds of capabilities. And your challenge as CIOs is to manage this burstable firewall, this firewall that allows you to go out and come back um, on an as-needed basis. Um, so if, again, I need 100% uh, of my database capacity, uh, my, of my data center capacity for 360 days a year, and then I need another 50% of capacity for five more days a year, I don't need, I can't build another data center. But if I can burst, and if I can manage across that firewall as if I was elastically moving into this new, uh, I I in into this new data center, that is the kind of functionality that I see most pervasive in the marketplace. So, recommendations for you is really to develop a cloud-first strategy. But 70% uh, of CIOs, we think, will, will, will embrace a cloud-first strategy by 2016. And about 23 enterprises, 23% of enterprises are doing that today. So again, you need to think about updating your standards, thinking about, the, the, we, we believe the enterprise architect will become one of the most important roles in the organization. And again, you need, really need to think about the skills in your organization and how do you get people who can think about an architecture from your current data center out into a new data, uh, out into the cloud and back as a way to really architect a new kind of um, way to, to interact with your IT service and also interact with the line of business. So some long-term reflection points around the cloud. We believe that over 50% of US companies will have more than 50% of their IT assets in third-party data centers by 2016. So that gives you an idea of how much growth we'll see in the cloud. By 2016, over 60% of the enterprise class storage capacity will be in the cloud. Again, doubling the amount of data we have about every 12 to 18 months. We think public cloud will dominate the big data marketplace. This intersection between cloud and big data will be a fascinating intersection. And we think that over time, because there'll be a skills gap in terms of big data, you'll need to move to, uh, the, the, the big data scientists will need to move to the cloud in order to scale their offerings to more mid-market companies. Um, so big data will emerge as a primary, so today it's quite low, it will emerge as a primary driver for cloud adoption. There's so much data out there, but there's a lot of information that's not generally known that you'd love to index against all this cloud data. So we think cloud data providers will engage in a data arms race to try to accumulate via self-collection from their customers as well as procure a third party, the strongest portfolio of public and for-fee data sets. Things like earnings potential and earnings uh, data for New Zealand, for, for, for citizens that can be anonymized. Um, data that you may have already in your cloud from customers like you that you can compare. Because the way you'll differentiate some of these cloud offerings is to be able to create the most effective data set that people can benchmark against to try to figure out how is the most effective organization run and am I really good? Um, at doing that. So the network effect comes in where more people that are using the cloud service, the better the benchmark data. So look for a data arms race and look for competition here when you start evaluating your cloud suppliers. And by 2017, almost 30% of all high-end data center space, 100 million square feet, uh, will be at service provider data centers. So this is really, again, where's the innovation in data centers gonna be, gonna be happening? Not all of it, but a lot of it will be happening at these cloud service providers, really innovating, creating data centers in new ways. And then, of course, regional and national data sovereignty requirements <clears throat> will prevent consolidation of cloud service providers. You may see the, the companies start to consolidate, but the actual data centers will not be able to consolidate because we're just going to have too much uh, 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 sensitivity around moving data off of uh, sovereign nation soil uh, for, the, for the citizens of those nations. So expect to see a large number of these data centers being run by uh, a relatively limited number of companies. Let's change gears and talk a little bit about big data and what's happening in big data. People talk to me a lot about big data and they say, yeah, we're supporting Hadoop, we're using big data. And the truth is that big data breaks out into a number of different categories when you think about big data. There's, de there's decision support and, 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 and automation of the, of the interface in, in order to more, more, more effectively make uh, uh, decisions around the information that you're getting. There's the process of, and the tools of analytics and discovery uh, and the software related to that. 
There's, of course, how do you organize your data, and therefore, can you manage your data and the data and organization and management tools? And then, of course, there's the infrastructure, the software and hardware, sometimes virtualized, uh, 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 infrastructure that's actually running all these applications. I put this up there as a framework to say there are many, many companies in this big data marketplace. You know, obviously some are database companies like the object-oriented or, or the, 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 uh, the object uh, uh, database companies as well as the, relation uh, the relational database companies. But then of course there are companies that are getting into predictive analytics, the people like SAS and IBM and, and, and Oracle. Then there's the Hadoop ecosystem. This is not a fair comparison, but think about Hadoop a little bit like Linux. From, a, from, from being an environment, there, there are many different uh, comparisons, but think about it being uh, an environment that's really you know, becoming a collection of companies that are building around a common platform. And these are, these are management analysis, these are, these are integration companies, as well as they are standard application companies. And you can see you know, a lot of these are, are, are very, very small companies like Datamir. Then, of course, there are companies that provide search and discovery for the big data uh, marketplace. Uh, th and then, um, not only, you may want to actually look at your data as it streams by to do high-speed streaming. You may want to be able to do some inspection of that data or actually just get the data to a new place faster. And then, of course, we've heard a lot about graph databases recently and sort of how you visually represent data. This market will consolidate rather dramatically, but I give you this slide just to show kind of the framework of all the mosaic of companies that are going after the different aspects. It's not just about you know, the Hadoop ecosystem, uh, ecosystem attacking the large database guys. There are lots of other tools um, that, are, that, that are in play here. But it's also not just about the technology. When we survey the marketplace, we find that the top IT challenges to delivering successful analytic solutions are things like, can I integrate my data? Can I manage my data? Can I manage the cost associated with this technology? Um, on the right-hand side, you've got you know, the business challenges. Ha can I define a business requirement? Do I have the, um, uh, the sufficient number of staff who, who can actually who have the skills uh, to do this? And obviously, can I secure a budget? Because these are really expensive problems. So that cost of the technology combined with that securing the budget means that something's got to break in this big data marketplace. And we think that what's going to break is the cloud is going to come in and really change this game. So from a business intelligence you know, strategy, we, 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 we think you're going to see a whole new kind of project. You're going to see projects with you know, um, uh, a lot of experimentation, fast-to-fail kinds of projects, a lot of different departments in your organization wanting to test and, 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 and spin up and, and try out uh, analyzing different data sets that are, that are anonymized and that they can, they, 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 they can you know, secure, you know, from a security standpoint, properly analyze, but then move on to the next thing. So you're going to need a lot of skills to get this done. And the challenges that you'll face, not all, as I said, the high cost of technology, in, uh, uh, insufficient resources, the fact that integrating this data is going to become very, very complex, um, and skills. So the inflection points that we think set up the challenges for big data are as follows. We think that value-based and transaction-based pricing for analytic services will become widespread. So think a cloud service provider that can offer price per recommendation. So I'm not necessarily building that whole system. I'm just going to a cloud service provider, I'm bringing in my business requirements, and eventually I'm getting a price for the number of questions that I can get answered. And this is, this is where we're going to be headed here. By 2017, we think a quarter of the Fortune 500 will have artificial question and answer systems in place, operating in call centers, um, as well as you know, retail stores. Think IBM Watson, tuned for healthcare. IBM Watson, tuned for retail. Where you can basically use this artificial intelligence to tune a high performance computer to answer these kinds of questions. But the problem is that's only what the most demanding customers can, can afford. What about everybody else? Well, you know, again, we think that real time monitoring of streaming data will become pervasive. Today, it's a combination of online and offline. But as bandwidth uh, capacity increases and real time streaming tools increase, you'll be able to analyze data much, much faster. And then again, as I, as I, as I said, um, as more of the data scientists move to the cloud to be able to scale these applications to new kinds of companies, which is where we expect uh, we will go, we think that Microsoft, who learned a valuable lesson from Linux, having fought Linux year after year after year, 
will move, will, will represent 40% of the Hadoop deployments. And Hadoop will be will deployed broadly on-premise in Windows servers, as well as in the cloud through Microsoft Azure. Microsoft has a, has a, a modular architecture that people understand. They'll replicate that architecture in the cloud, and they will, uh, again, create an environment where the Hadoop platform and Hadoop tools can, can, can be made available um, by cloud service providers. And this will change the big data game at that intersection of cloud and big data. So, uh, talking about social media for a little bit. I get a lot of questions about social. Um, we asked the question, has your company selected uh, for purchase any enterprise social software solutions in the past 12 months? Yeah. Fine, two-thirds of the people have, in fact, selected social. Not a surprise. But then you ask this question, and you say, please indicate the level of agreement, which is uh, appropriate to your applicable to your organization. We are able to effectively measure the ROI of our social business partnership. This is not a typo. They either strongly disagree, they disagree, or they don't know. Nobody strongly agrees or agrees. Basically, people feel like they have absolutely no idea whether they're getting a payback from social or not. They're, they're, they're flying blind around social. When you ask the question about how do businesses leverage social software, you find some interesting trends. Let me show you, this is the data from this year. This is the data from a year ago. Same, same question. What you find is that communicating with colleagues and, 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 ask, and, 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 and acquiring knowledges and, and asking questions, those were number one in 2011. So basically, watching was what people did with social media a year ago. Now, they're starting to gather feedback. They're starting to respond to questions. They're starting to, they're starting to communicate with partners and suppliers. So again, I guess the, how the conversation is changing is it's going from leaning back and just watching to leaning forward and saying, how can I start to be a part of the conversation and change the dialogue a little bit as I use my social tools? So this is an important trend that we're starting to see uh, in the marketplace. By and large, when you look at departments that use social media, almost without, example, without exception, it's sales and marketing. Uh, whether it's financial services through, through uh, manufacturing, th dis distribution services, um, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, the public sector is the only example where uh, it's not that way, and public sector is simply because customer service is kind of a proxy for um, sales, if you will. So, so again, these are the kinds of people that are using this technology. The realities, though, um, is that expect a lot of pilots. Um, we expect that, that social, tool will, social will get integrated into more and more, and I'll make some predictions around this, more and more enterprise apps. Expect a lot of experimentation from places like marketing. And, 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 and expect that uh, you're going to need to have um, you know, popular products around file sharing, around collaboration. And those are the ones that are going to come in uh, and be sponsored by the CIO. It's the, it's the ones that are going to be you know, a lot harder that are coming in through marketing or coming in through sales that are the ones that become more at risk for um, security problems or governance problems or, or, or compliance problems. And those are the ones that uh, you want to watch out for because, as we can tell, 68% of CIOs have really no formal policies regarding data retention in the social media play space. We've got to start thinking about social media not as something that's happening outside of the organization, but something that we have a strategy for in the organization going forward. And social maturity, it absolutely starts with experimentation. You really have to empower your line of businesses to experiment, but experiment within, within some, some specific confines. What's interesting about social, and, and I, I ask you, please don't dismiss social as a toy that marketing uses. What's interesting about social is we believe it represents a hallmark and a change. And when we look back five years from now, we will have said something fundamentally happened with social and it changed the way we did business. For decades in this industry, we have built transaction processing systems. Make the bits go faster. Make the, make the, the speed of the transaction is what it's all about. And look no further than financial services. That's what you see there. And then we went into decision support systems. Help me make better business decisions for using IT to grow my business or to more effectively run my business. And we believe what we're moving to is a relationship-based system, our relationship-based system. And these relationship-based systems are based on the very premise that, 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 that companies are collections of individuals. And those individuals have things to share. They share things in the cloud 
and they share th through their company, and they share things with their own personal cloud. And the more information I can collect about the individuals in my company and about the individuals in the companies that I work with, and as well as those consumers who also have information in the cloud, the better business decisions I can make. So at some point, we have to become more comfortable with the amount of sharing that we're doing in social media in order to make business decisions that are uh, more effective for our business. So again, if I have five Twitter followers on, 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 on Twitter, and Paul Strong has 5,000 Twitter followers, who's our next speaker, and we both drive Audis, and we both have a terrible customer service experience, who do you think is going to get the better service by using a tool like this? The person who's more influential, the person who's got followers, who's, in, who's got followers who are engaged and who can interact with those followers. But to make that business decision, you have to have linked your sales intelligence to your customer service to your, to your, to your field support. And that all happens in this new construct. But it's, it's a leap because we have to get to a point where people are comfortable with what they're sharing in the cloud and that that's not being used for not, for that it's not being used for nefarious uh, things. And again, look no further than kids. Look at the amount of information that they're comfortably sharing in the cloud that helps them and eases the jobs they need to get done every single day, as opposed to the silly pictures of them standing on a keg and, and drinking. And there is a lot of good information that can come out of this, and I think this is what we have to think about in order to re-engineer our business. So for social, some of the long-term reflection points are, we believe social is redefining marketing support to create a 360-degree view of customers. By, for, by, by 2020, we think 40% of the G2000 will have redefined marketing and customer support functions as a result of social, as a result of using new social tools. This is not a typo. The majority of applications will become social. The majority, even the one that you're managing your robots in the factory, there will be a social aspect to those kinds of applications. We think social enterprise software grows 40% by 2016. Oh, and guess what? Traditional email, that will drop 35% a year per year for the next two years in terms of the amount of email traffic. How many people feel like they get less email today than they got a year ago? Interesting. I know, I, I, I definitely feel like the amount of email is starting to come down. Let me ask another question. How many people uh, still feel like they get as many voice calls as they got five years ago? All right. We're, it, it, again, these, these things go in cycles. Trust me, email will be dropping down as we move to new ways to communicate. Sense and respond business models will replace make sell. Today we make the product, we ship it to the channel, we cross our fingers and hope, and then we sell it through. And if it doesn't sell through, we give massive incentives to sell products. In the future, what we'd like to be able to get to is sense and respond business models using social to be able to not overbuild or not miscalculate how much demand we will need, all using social tools to make better business decisions. And again, a next generation platform, as I just laid out, really redefines applications as we know them, componentizing into apps, into services that can be shared across the organization to enable these, make sell, these, uh, these uh, sense and respond business models. And this means the merging of these transaction, decision, and now new relationship-based systems into a next generation social enabled enterprise. So let's talk a little bit about mobile and the, the, last, the, the, the last area. Um, this is a, a visual representation of, of the number of devices that ship. The size of the square is the size of the market. The size of the slice is the market share. In 1999, it was a great world for CIOs and mobile devices. It was very, very simple. You got to be a dictator. You got to say, these are the devices we're going to use. We're going to use Windows. It's going to be great. And you use desktops and you use mobile. By 2007, uh, so by 2011, it changed dramatically. In 2007, you can see now I'm supporting... Windows and Apple on the much smaller, as a percent of the total, portable and desktop market. This thing called the smartphone has moved in where I've got Android, I've got iOS, I've got Symbian, I've got Blackberry, um, I've got a Windows phone. And then on the tablet side, I've got iOS, I've got Android. Oh, and by the way, I have forked Android. I have a, a new flavor of Android, which, which Amazon is bringing into the marketplace. So it's very, very complex 
world of, of, of clients. People ask me all the time, so really, when it, how should I look at the connected device market? I say, look at them all as smart connected devices. Add tablets, PCs, and smartphones together, and you see some interesting trends for CIOs. About 36% of your market is Wintel, and about 30% of your market is Android on ARM, and about 14% is iOS. So the whole world is not moving iOS when you add all these devices together. By 2013, about 40% of your market is Android on ARM, and about 20% of your market is iOS, and about 25% is Wintel. And you can see that it's still pretty, pr pretty, pretty steady, but actually Android on ARM uh, gets even a little bit higher by 2015. So the message here is that you're going to be managing a diverse environment. Those of you that think somehow you can turn the clock back and you can go back to a world, just say, fine, if they don't want Blackberries any longer, give them all iOS devices. It's not going to work that way. You're going to have diverse you're going to have diversity around the, uh, the, the architectures, and that means you're going to have to have a more complex uh, application development market um, going forward. We absolutely believe that consumerization is strategic. And if you ask this question, the number of uh, employee-owned devices used to access enterprise data has gone from up from 31% in 2010 to 68% in 2012. It'll be 75% this year. P if you don't think people are accessing your corporate data with their personal devices, you are absolutely killing yourself, kidding yourself. And that's why a lot of CIOs I talk to are rushing to the private cloud to develop private cloud portals to be able to say, look, you've got to be using this browser and you got to be using one, you know, Android 4.0 or iOS uh, or higher if you want to be able to access this information. Because it's just, you know, simply, there has, to, there has to be some prescription on the rules. It can't be completely the wild, wild west. When you do a survey about how people feel, pe people, pe people feel that uh, tablets such as iPads are, or, or similar devices are integral to, to how to how business gets done, that's how they feel. The second one is the IT department's workload increases. Sorry, that got cut off. But absolutely, 80% of I, you know, it, it, people agree 80% of the time that the IT department has more stress as a result of this decision. But at the same time, the senior executives expect you to do it, and allowing employees to bring these devices increases morale. So these are all kind of the conundrum that you're facing. And what it all adds up to is mobile devices are here to stay. These devices are going to be diverse, and it is considered an eventuality, and quite frankly, senior management expects you to support them going forward. What we see in mobility when we talk to developers is that we see that the, the kinds of services that are on the rise are things like location-based services and notifications. And those are really down from what we were doing a year ago, which was things like check-ins uh, on Foursquare or, 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 or places, um, or even you know, sharing things on, 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 on uh, on Flickr, uh, which was photo collection. Really, it's really about location and context going forward. And that's why Apple is trying so hard to buy into a mapping platform or to grow their own mapping, pro to, to, to grow their own mapping product, because location and context will be the big differentiator um, going forward. Um, in 2013, uh, sort of, you know, you know, when you think about refining your application strategy, uh, one third of all new application development will target uh, mobile form factors. Um, I find this stunning, and that is that you know IT has got to get their their device strategy under control because 46 percent of their budget is going toward maintenance, and that's just not sustainable. You've got to be able to shift that to application development because today 60 percent of new mobile apps are provided by third party or, or I, I, IT service providers. And I think that that's okay, but you need to have the right provider. You need to have those providers that can come in and really understand how to differentiate your business and how to create um, goodness for your brand associated with mobile apps. And I see too many CIOs are, are, are not thinking about how mobile is on the front lines of their customer experience. And they need to be thinking about how do I develop the apps that are gonna help grow my business as opposed to deal with the mobile apps that my constituents are going to be bringing into the organization. And it's a subtle change, but something you need to be thinking about is how do you strategize with the right outside company to develop the right mobile apps? And that means partnering with the business. So some long-term reflection points for mobile. Context-aware applications will accelerate mobile advertising to $33 billion in 2020, up from about $7 billion today. So mo mobile advertising will absolutely, uh, God help you if you click on a mobile ad today. You're kind of taked out of the application and it launches a new browser. It's a, a terrible, terrible experience. Hardware taxonomies will melt away. Per broadband connected household, 
We believe that by 2020, there will be 12 and a half devices in use per connected household. In the US, that number is 15. So you're seeing, you're, this is all your iPads, your smartphones, your Xbox, your PlayStation, your connected TVs, your connected picture frames, your Nest thermostats, all those things, 12 and a half devices per broadband connected household worldwide. So we are gonna be eating up a lot more bandwidth going forward, managing a lot more devices. We think 25% of mobile web transactions will be ambient compute enabled by 2020. What does that mean? That means I hold my phone up or I'm wearing Google Glass, I look through the rangefinder of the phone and there's an application that tells me just on the other side of that wall there's a coffee shop. I go down there and I buy a coffee. That's, that's ambient compute assisted. Or if I'm wearing Google Glass and, my, and I gaze over at, at, a, at, a, at, a, you know, at an at a, at a, at a Mercedes-Benz dealership and then I go in and, and, and ultimately buy a car, that's ambient computer assisted. So again, the idea of using location, using augmented reality to assist in transactions, I bring this up to you not because it's space age stuff, but because this is the stuff that's gonna help you work with the line of business to grow your business going forward and the stuff you should be focused on and thinking about bringing to them. Cars will be the next mobile frontier. We think 50% of automobiles will be shipping display, uh, shipping or displaying phone sourced media by uh, 2020. What does that mean? So is it really realistic to expect that we have another broadband connection in our car? It's interesting, if you look at Toyota, Scion, uh, which is a brand we have in the US, they actually took the nav system out of the car. They stopped offering it because their demographic couldn't afford to spend on uh, a $2,000 uh, 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 nav system. Instead, they take their iPhone or their Galaxy and they put it on the dashboard <laughs> and they use that map. So what happens eventually is that the, the display in the car becomes a mashup and it becomes a mashup of phone source data as well as data that's being represented on the car. And working out the interdependencies are really important as you think about next generation app development. Because we spend so much time in our cars in some of the mature regions around the world that this is an opportunity for advertising, this is an opportunity for customer stickiness, this is an opportunity to grow your business. Mobile payments will reach $1 trillion by 2018. That's still under 3% of the overall mobile payments market. We have a lot of work to go here. The people will start using mobile payments uh, more aggressively and it'll hit this interest interesting milestone but still 97% of the payments market to go. And then finally, near field communication will represent a way to democratize app distribution. Today, Apple, Google, and Microsoft decide which apps get advertised on the app stores. We believe with the NFC, which is a chip inside the phone, if I have an app that I'm interested in and Paul has an app that he's interested in and he wants to show me that app, we can tap phones. If he's on iOS and I'm on Android, I'm taken back to the uh, Android store. I'm told whether that uh, is a secure app or not, and then it's downloaded to my phone. That changes the whole game on app distribution. It no longer becomes a dictatorship. It becomes much more social, and it becomes much more of a meritocracy in terms of how apps are distributed, which is very important for those of you that will be developing next generation apps and thinking about how to get customer stickiness. So as I wrap up, it's really important that you think about developing a, a relationship with the line of business. We think that, uh, obviously, you know, CIOs, they institute 40 new projects uh, in, 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 in 2013, with or without IT. Um, and we see that about 58% of, of new IT investments involve direct participation by the line of business executives. And that will go up, and I'll show how much it goes up. Um, we think line of business will grow to be about to be participating in about 80% of projects over the next three years. So you can see that the projects that are just run by IT are now, you know, they're down to around 40%. And over time, it's about creating this partnership with business. And about, and again, it's not just about vetting the, uh, the, 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 the toys that, that the, the business wants to use. It's about sitting at the table with the business and saying, that is a technology that we can use to grow our business. And that is a big change and a change that's happening on top of the third platform. So, you know, best practices for working at the line of business, you know, it's really about working with the business units to develop consensus around prioritization of IT products. What should we be working on? It's about IT leadership being a part of the business management groups. And it's about assigning your professionals to work in those groups to help have that conversation I just mentioned, which is, no, 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 that technology is not gonna really work here. This one will help you grow in a new mobile app-enabled world.
This is how location and context works, marketing, and this is how you should be thinking about using it. That's a, a really, really important you know, part of the future here and how, how you can differentiate and help the business succeed in new ways. So <clears throat> the power of the third platform is really, you know, it's twofold. When you look at the power of the third platform, it's about how do you take these forces and unlock the value of these forces across each of the areas. New York City had a problem, right? New York City wanted to open up more of their data sets and really innovate their whole approach to e-government. So what they did was they ran a series of hackathons to reinvent nyc.gov. They engaged a community of coders locally. They wanted to open up APIs and have a more open government. They opened up hundreds of data sets. They provided, of course, access through hackathons and, 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 and they wanted the fiber they wanted to foster a vibrant digital sector. So this is some of the statistics of, of, of what they did. They ran, um, uh, they got 200 participants, they ran 15 hackathons, they opened up 900 data sets, and they got 600 ideas submitted for how they could become a new smart city and, 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 and create new applications th th through the collection of uh, developers that they had in their city. What they got were things like NYC 3.1, which allows you to report a street pothole or a street light that's burned out or, or repair a street sign or repair a street condition or maybe if a, if a, if a gutter is, 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 is bubbling up and bubbling over. They got things like Rotify, which allow you to see real time, is the ferry going to be late? Is the bus going to be late? By tracking people that are on that bus and moving. So again, real time analytics to be able to see how mass transit's moving in the city. They wanted to foster a digital site. They wanted to foster uh, movie production and film production. But there are problems with movie and film production. How do you make sure that you're OK to film on a specific street corner? How do you make sure that uh, the extras are cleared to be in the movie? Uh, is it OK to have a business? Is, have you, do you have proper release assigned for a business's name to be in a movie? They developed an app to pre-vet all that so that people could easily sign up to participate and vet locations and vet extras for movies. In the United States, we have an application called Yelp. Do you have that application here? Do, do, so, so Yelp allows you to see what restaurant reviews are and how, how restaurants are good. They have a different problem in New York because they have many, many small sort of no-name restaurants. So they had this, which is basically the reverse of Yelp, where basically if, if, the, if the restaurant's not in compliance of the Board of Health, with the Board of Health, and people have gotten sick there, don't go there. I love that you can check in on Foursquare, by the way. But, that, th again, this is, this is the kind of stuff that helps the society. So the goal is, of course, to become a third platform IT shop, but really, how do you become a third platform enterprise? How do you partner with the business to uh, enable the massive amount of, in of, of innovation that's going to happen above the third platform in each of these industries? Because that is not a decision that you should not be a part of. That, that's a decision you should be a part of. Because by 2020, we think that 67% of these four pillar solutions will have line of business as the buyer. But it, it also means that they're going to need help making those decisions as they're approached by all these different, different kinds of service providers. So we expect IT growth to be between 35 and 5%. We think the four pillars are having a profound effect on the overall industry. They're changing the way we work. They're changing the way we play. They're changing the way we think about growing our businesses in the future. And they're also not discrete. By 2016, we think that over half of the cloud investments will be labeled something other than cloud in the future because it'll be one of those invisible and plain sight technologies where cloud will be just simply everywhere. And when you start a new company, you won't think about buying a bunch of servers and buying a bunch of application software. You think about buying basically some clients and then how do I procure the services I need to run my business. So customers are being enabled in your ways, in new ways. Um, and your challenge is to really help identify these products and services that will allow you to really harness the power of this new world and how this world is really so much fundamentally different than the era before. So I hope I've opened your eyes. I hope I've uh, spurred some thoughts. And uh, with that, I will uh, say thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you a fantastic day.